Thank you very much, Sonia, and welcome today to all of you. I particularly want to welcome you to the Sun Health Center for Health and Wellbeing if you've not been here before. Uh, so welcome, we hope to see you more. Um, today, we are gonna talk a little bit how about how to modify our favorite recipes uh, for living better and well with diabetes. I am also gonna give you some tips and some pointers on how to cook and bake with sugar substitutes. So do any of you cook or bake with a sugar substitute? Uh, currently a couple, that's good. So I'm gonna give you a few uh, tricks of the trade uh, so uh, that you're not afraid to use them in the future if you feel they would work for you. So uh, one in three Americans has prediabetes uh, and one in 11 Americans has uh, diabetes. So the great news is uh, today's grocery store shelves are filled with more and more items that we can purchase and, and so we can modify our favorite recipes to lower the calories and the fat grams and live healthier with diabetes. So when we think about a healthy recipe, we want to take a look at the calories. Uh, if you lower your calories, it's going to help you manage your weight, which is going to help you manage your blood sugars, which is going to help you manage your diabetes more effectively and other chronic disease. We also want to take a look at the grams of carbohydrate. One serving of carbohydrate is considered 15 grams of total carbohydrate. Uh, and also, we want to take a look at the fat in our recipes. Uh, we know that uh, diabetes and heart health and heart disease go hand in hand. Uh, so we want to be become more familiar with the fat in our recipes and how we can modify those recipes, uh, particularly saturated fat. Uh, your total calories, uh, about 7% or less of those total calories should be from saturated fat. Uh, for some of us, that can mean uh, as low as 9 to 15 grams a day of saturated fat. Uh, and also sodium. Uh, many of us who uh, have diabetes or prediabetes also have hypertension, so it's so very important that we control the sodium in our diet. Uh, if you are over the age of 51, it is recommended that you aim for 1,500 milligrams of sodium daily. Uh, if you are under the age of 51 and you have diabetes or chronic kidney disease or hypertension, it's also recommended that you aim for 1,500 milligrams of sodium daily. Uh, if not, if you're under the age of 51 with no chronic disease, about 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium is recommended. The average American consumes upwards of 3,400 milligrams or sodium or more daily. So uh, we have some work to do, and, and most of that comes from restaurants and, and processed foods. So when we take a look at some of our healthy recipes, whether it's an entree or dessert, I wanted to give you some parameters as to what constitutes a, a healthy uh, recipe. Uh, if you're looking at an entree, such as a meat item or a, a favorite casserole, try to aim for less than 350 calories, uh, less than 40 grams of carbohydrate, less than five grams of saturated fat, and less than 500 milligrams of sodium. If you're looking at a favorite dessert that you want to modify or ask the question, is it, is it healthy? Uh, look at the calories. Uh, try to aim for less than 250 calories per serving. Uh, less than 22 grams of carbohydrate would be a great limit for carbohydrate on a favorite dessert. Less than three grams of saturated fat and less than 250 milligrams of sodium. Uh, if you want to look at a complete meal, meaning a protein, a good source of protein, maybe a piece of meat and a starch and a vegetable, and this will vary depending upon your calorie level. So you have, if you have questions about how many calories you should be following to maintain your weight or lose weight, it's good that you talk with a registered dietitian. But this is just one example here uh, based on 2,000 calories. Uh, uh, the protein and the starch and the vegetable together uh, should be less than 500 calories, less than 75 grams of total carbohydrate, and less than 7 grams of saturated fat, and less than 750 milligrams of sodium. So that kind of gives you some parameters. Uh, if we are looking at sauces and dressings per tablespoon, aim for less than 40 calories, less than 15 grams of total carbohydrate, and let's aim for zero trans fats. Uh, trans fats are the really bad artery clogging fat. The FDA hopes to eliminate them by 2018. 
Uh, and it's not uncommon to go to the grocery store and get your favorite salad dressing and it might be low fat or fat free, but it can have upwards of 300 milligrams of sodium in just two tablespoons. And sometimes when we lower the fat, uh, you know, it may lower the calories, but they add a little sugar in there too once in a while too. So I'm going to give you some pointers for how to make your own salad dressings at home uh, to eat much healthier. Uh, when you're looking at a side dish, such as a muffin or bread or any side dish, uh, aim for less than 250 calories. Again, less than 22 grams of total carbohydrate, uh, less than three grams of saturated fat, and less than 250 milligrams of sodium. So uh, hopefully that give you a, will give you a few of your parameters for your favorite recipes. Uh, the good news uh, as well is there are a lot of websites. Uh, how many of you like to use the internet or have a favorite go-to for to track your fitness? Great, almost everybody raised their hand, that's wonderful. Um, there are three of my favorites if you want to modify or calculate your own nutritional analysis, if you're modifying your own recipe, would be sparkpeople.com. It has a recipe calculator. Basically, you enter your ingredient and how much, and then it will compute a nutritional analysis for your favorite recipe if you want to modify it. So. Also, MyFitnessPal.com is a very popular fitness tracker program. It also does nutritional analysis for recipes. And CalorieCount.com is another one of my favorites. There are lot, lots more out there. So basically, when we think about modifying a recipe, there's two ways that you can modify a recipe. You can either alter the ingredients, or you can change the cooking technique, or you can do both. Uh, so when you think about altering ingredients in a recipe, what ingredients or macronutrients come to mind uh, that is going to make that, uh, that recipe healthier? Does anyone want to share? Joan? You could change the flour for breading to whole wheat flour. Right. You could change the flour in the breading, and we're going to talk about that to get more fiber. That's a great, great suggestion. You can change the fat to lower the calories, absolutely. A gram of fat is nine calories, and some of you know this already, but for those of you that don't, a gram of carbohydrate is four calories. So fat has twice the calories than car that carbohydrate does. So, and back to the fiber, it will help fill you up and it will, that will help manage your blood sugars as well. So we want to aim for, we always say as dietitians, half that plate, fruits and vegetables, and there's a reason, and fiber is one of them. So, so very good suggestions. Uh, so ingredients that we can alter, uh, you know, take a look at sugar again. You, you can, and, and fat, uh, you can be just fine with just your standard recipe and reducing the fat and the sugar by about 25 to 35 percent in most cases if you don't want to try a sugar substitute or an artificial sweetener. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, and ask yourself what you really need in the recipe or, and what you don't need in the recipe. Do you have to have the sour cream? Do you have to add the, add, have the cheese? Oftentimes, you know, it's just fine to, you know, extra vegetables versus the cheese. So, and herbs, and, and we'll talk about other ways to make your food flavorful without adding extra sugar or fat. So, so sugar and fat are two great ways to lower the overall calories. Uh, and again, the sodium. So when we think about healthy fat substitutes, uh, I'm going to give you a few suggestions here. Uh, a lot of us already use low over-the-counter, uh, low-fat uh, items such as cottage cheese or sour cream or cream cheese. Uh, these all make great substitutes and recipes for mayo or heavy cream or just a low-calorie alternative. Uh, cottage cheese is a great source of protein. Uh, that combined with a, a vegetable uh, and another item uh, can make a, a good meal replacement, quick, easy meal. Uh, when we think about vegetable sprays, and most of us nowadays do use the vegetable sprays, uh, they're great for coating and baking and frying. Just a one second spray of vegetable oil is only about seven calories, as opposed to one tablespoon of oil. Vegetable oil is about 120 calories. And often when we saute or fry, we overestimate on the oil that we really need. Uh, so a one second spray of vegetable spray, only about seven calories, a, gr a great way to reduce your fat grams and your total calories. Uh, also, how many of you liked yogurt, particularly Greek yogurt? So I, I see quite a few hands, that's great. Uh, it, the Greek yogurt especially is very creamy. It makes a nice substitute for butter in recipes if you've not tried it. 
uh, when there's lots of uh, creamy uh, Greek yogurts that you can substitute butter one for one in recipes. Uh, one of my favorites is the Faye yogurt. It's pronounced F-A-G-E, but it makes a great substitute for butter in some of your favorite recipes. And you'll also get a little bit of protein uh, and a lot less fat grams, which is gonna lower your calories. So you might try some yogurt. Um, instead of one egg, uh, try two egg whites or a fourth of a cup of egg substitute. Uh, an egg white uh, without the yolk, the yolk is where the cholesterol is and the fat is, so the egg white still has about almost four grams of protein, about 3.6 grams of protein uh, in one egg white. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we can use egg whites in our favorite recipes. So. Um, Pureed or blended fruits. I have a favorite pumpkin bread recipe and it makes three loaves of pumpkin bread and it has one cup of vegetable oil. It has uh, one and three fourths cup of sugar. It has pumpkin puree, it has eggs, it has baking uh, soda and sugar. I don't think I'm missing anything, but I like to modify that recipe to save uh, calories. Instead of using a cup of regular or vegetable oil, I'll use just a half a cup and save over 900 calories. There is nine, over 900 calories in just a half a cup of vegetable oil. So, so I cut the oil in half and I substitute applesauce for that other half a cup of vegetable oil. And it wouldn't have to be applesauce, it could be another pureed fruit that's a favorite of yours. So, uh, and save, you know, again, over 900 calories. The applesauce is gonna add moisture to my bread or your baked good and a little bit of sweetness too. So don't be afraid to cut, again, you can cut back 25 to 35% of the sugar and the fat in a recipe and still be fine. Try it. So uh, evaporated uh, skim milk uh, is also a good alternative for heavy cream. Uh, use a thickener such as flour or cornstarch to add to it to substitute for heavy cream. Uh, if, you, if you mix it up with a little skim milk, your cornstarch, your flour in advance, uh, or a little bit of water, and then mix it with uh, whatever it is you're making, your, your, your skim milk, uh, substitute for every cream or a gravy, uh, it's a great uh, way to thicken your recipe or your sauce or your soup uh, without adding a lot of extra calories. One tablespoon of cornstarch or flour is only about 30 calories. So, so don't be afraid. Uh, sometimes I think we think we need to add more fat to thicken up things or I can't make gravy, I'll buy it, I'll buy it at the grocery store. Uh, there are so many things that we can do from scratch at home to make our own uh, uh, baked goods uh, taste better. So, uh, pureed beans. Have any of you ever, uh, any, any bean lovers? They're great for diabetes as well because they're high in fiber, they're high in protein, no fat or very low fat. Uh, instead of a, a heavy, like a mayonnaise or a salad dressing in a dip recipe or, or regular sour cream, try to puree beans and substitute for half of the fat in, in your favorite dip uh, that you love with your chips or your vegetables. So that's a way to lower the calories significantly, get a little bit of fiber. And again, you have to do a little a bit of experimenting, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So, and some other low-calorie, uh, flavorful tips. Does anyone, uh, have you ever thought of substituting cauliflower for mashed potatoes? Or for potatoes, great, I see a few hands, wonderful. So you can actually cut up a head of cauliflower into little pieces, uh, put it on tin foil, uh, spray it with, with vegetable spray, cover it all up, roast it in the oven at 350 to 400 degrees for 20 to 40 minutes, uh, and then you can puree that in your food processor or blender. And then you can add some Greek yogurt, and that makes a great substitute for mashed potatoes. Give it a try. Uh, the Greek yogurt is gonna be, and again, a half a cup of mashed potatoes is about 80 calories, and that's without all the added good stuff like the butter and the sour cream and the cream cheese and all the yummy things we like to add. But try making mashed potatoes uh, from cauliflower and adding the Greek yogurt to get the creaminess and some flavor uh, and a little bit of protein too, so. Uh, make your own salad dressings. Um, try it. Your flavored vinegars and your lemon or lime juice or orange juice with just a modest amount of uh, your favorite vegetable oil uh, can go a long way uh, and save a lot of calories. Again, two tablespoons of a, a grocery store bought in salad dressing can have upwards of 300 milligrams of sodium. And just because it's low in fat doesn't mean it's lower in sugar. Uh, so experiment and make your own salad dressings. Add your favorite herbs to carry the flavor. We don't need a lot of sauce and dressing on our salads and a lot of our favorite foods. 
Uh, so use herbs, cilantro, ginger, garlic, uh, lemongrass, basil, chives, just a few examples. Use the herbs to carry the flavor. And low sodium uh, bouillon as well. Uh, we can use that to poach a chicken breast or, or, or just water to, to poach it as opposed to breading it or frying it or sauteing it. Uh, and you can, you can uh, steam vegetables in low sodium broth as well to add a little bit of flavor. So when all else fails, <laughs> If you don't want a mutt, you don't have to use a sugar substitute or an artificial sweetener. Maybe you love your recipe and you're going to make it and that's fine. But remember, it's all about your calories, lowering your calories and your portions. So, and that's a big stack of pancakes. <laughs> so has anyone heard of faux frying? It's a technique that you, you can actually use it for, for meat or, or vegetables. Uh, you, you make a modified breading with wheat flour. Uh, you use whipped egg whites uh, and versus whole eggs. And you would use the whole wheat panko bread crumbs. That would, they're crunchy and they add fiber. So basically, you would dip your meat or whatever it is you want to faux fry in your egg whites and, uh, and roll it in wheat flour uh, and then add some panko breadcrumbs and then spray it with vegetable spray, put it in the oven. It makes a great substitute uh, that carries flavor, uh, lower in calories, uh, makes a great substitute for a fried food. So try that sometime. Also, uh, there's another technique called flash frying. Uh, it's a great way to significantly lower uh, the fat and the calories in fried foods. You would actually po your, poach your meat in a low sodium broth or water, so you're kind of pre-cooking it until it's almost done. And then you would coat it with like a low fat buttermilk and whole wheat flour, and then you could deep fat fry it in a vegetable oil. And because the meat is pre-cooked, it's a nice, light, healthy breading, you're not gonna absorb as much oil and as much calories. So, and you can save you know, upwards of a thousand calories or more in just a few pieces of meat uh, by uh, frying them this way and for a short period of time. Uh, just a review of the healthiest oils to fry with. Use a mono or a polyunsaturated oil, uh, such as uh, canola oil, peanut oil, safflower oil. Olive oil makes a great monounsaturated oil to saute with. Uh, soybean oil, uh, so try to stick with a mono or a polyunsaturated uh, oil. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about cooking and baking with sugar substitutes. Do any of you, I, I know a few of you said do already cook with some of the sugar substitutes, so I was pleasantly surprised at some of the research that I did, so I want to share that with you. Uh, sugar substitutes are artificial sweeteners. Uh, they contain little or no calories or carbohydrate. They're chemically or plant-based. Uh, they're hundreds of times sweeter than regular sugar, and they should have little or no effect on your blood sugar, which is good news for, for people with diabetes. Um, so then there's sugar alcohols, and I know you've probably seen these on your food labels as well and in some of your favorite foods. Uh, uh, if you have a favorite sugar-free ice cream and you look at the food label, I guarantee you it probably has a sugar alcohol in it. So they contain about half the calories and carbohydrate as sugar, and they're metabolized as a carbohydrate. Uh, they can have side effects if you can, don't consume them in moderation. Uh, some examples of sugar alcohols would be sorbitol, uh, mannitol, urethritol, xylitol. So you definitely want to consume them in moderation, and large amounts can affect your blood sugar. So if you see a sugar alcohol on a food label, you want to count that as, as part of your carbohydrate per the meal or your dessert. So, and again, you'll see them mostly in sugar-free candies and, and sugar-free ice creams that you can get at grocery stores. So... Sugar, we can't live with it, we can't live without it. <laughs> it's it's excess, su excess sugar in our diets, we know can attribute to obesity and type two uh, diabetes, but it is essential for baking. Uh, sugar carries taste and texture and color in our favorite baked goods, as we're gonna see here shortly. It gives volume to our favorite cakes and cookies and brownies. It holds moisture in our favorite cookies. It's, a, a, it's responsible for the browning often in your favorite nut breads, uh, and it feeds the yeast for leavening in bread. So uh, it's not easy to replace sugar. And when, you're, when you do replace sugar and bake with a sugar substitute or artificial sweetener, you are gonna have to change your game plan a little bit and make some changes. 
This is an example of a white cake made with uh, NutraSweet, which is the brand name for aspartame. And you can see how it is much lighter in color. Uh, NutraSweet, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually made with saccharin. That's the next slide. So yeah, this white cake here was made with saccharin. That's the oldest sweetener. It's been around since World War I when there was no sugar. Uh, they used saccharin instead. Uh, we still use it today. It doesn't make the best uh, sugar to substitute with in your baked goods, but you can see how much lighter this white cake is made with saccharin. Uh, this is a white cake made with NutraSweet or aspartame, and you can see it is much flatter as well. So uh, my favorite uh, pumpkin bread recipe that I make, uh, the recipe calls for it, the loaves to bake for 50 minutes, and when I, I lowered the oil in it and I used a sugar blend, uh, and it was done in about 30 to 40 minutes. So it's really important when you're baking with your sugar substitutes to keep an eye on your, your product. Use that toothpick. When you pull it out of the bread or your favorite baked good, it should be clean. So uh, they don't always brown the best on the top either, but a good little trick is when you pull it out of the oven, just spray it with a little bit of vegetable spray. That will add a little bit of moisture and, a, and, and color it, uh, make it a little bit browner too. So. Um, so, some of these sweeteners, aftertaste is common, although I will say I was pleasantly surprised with some of the sugar blends, and I'm going to show you those in a minute here, uh, at, at how, you know, really a good product, a good baked product they really did make without much aftertaste or any. Uh, so, and again, your cooking time may need to be adjusted, and, and uh, if you bake with a sugar substitute, you could have a drier product as well. So there are currently eight uh, sugar substitutes that are approved by the FDA. Just a couple ones that you're probably more familiar with. Uh, the Sunet or the Sweet One is the brand name for Asulfane K. Uh, Equal or NutraSweet is the brand name for Aspartame. Uh, one of the new kids on the block is Monk Fruit Extract, and you probably have seen that in some of your grocery stores. It's been around for over 3,000 years. Uh, uh, it comes from Asia. Uh, but it's not, it's only generally recommended as safe. The government gave it generally recommended as safe status in 2008. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, again, saccharin is our oldest sweetener. It's brand name Sweet and Low, or Sugar Twin. Uh, stevia is really the new kid on the block, and I, I've done a lot of cooking and baking with stevia, and again, was pleasantly surprised. Uh, you'll see it in lots of different brand names out there on your grocery store shelves, such as Pure Via. Truvia, Sweet Leaf Zing, those are just a couple examples. Splenda, the little yellow packet most of us are familiar with, is the brand name for sucralose. So, I've done some research and in my own kitchen as well, and uh, the sugar sub blends get high marks for baking and cooking. Uh, Splenda makes them. Stevia has some sugar blends. Just a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a Splenda brown sugar blend. This is half sugar and half sugar substitute. So still lower in calories. Uh, really a great uh, alternative for regular sugar in your baked items. Uh, this is a Stevia product. It's called a Truvia sugar blend. So again, half the calories of regular sugar. Uh, you generally only need half as much in your, in your baked recipes. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I just wanted to show you them. Okay, a little bit more on Splenda. Uh, a lot of these sweeteners are four to 600 times sweeter than regular sugar. Uh, Splenda is very sweet. Uh, one teaspoon is only about one calorie, so it's insignificant. Zero, counted as zero grams of, of carbohydrate. Uh, one cup of the Splenda granulated Splenda. Again, our granulated Splenda is right here. It's a little bit different from the sugar blend. It's all artificial sweetener. Uh, one cup is about 48 calories. Uh, the, the Splenda, the granulated Splenda is heat stable and it's good for baking and cooking and canning. Uh, and it's also available in the brown sugar uh, version as well. So um, my advice to you would be to go to these wonderful websites. Splenda has a great website, splenda.com, for recipes and tips. I've left you with a couple conversion charts today too. So uh, if you don't want to make up your own recipe, you can always find a good one on the website. And, and uh, uh, lots of good tips. So Splenda goes back to 1976. It was considered safe in 1999 by the FDA. It should not affect your blood sugar level. The, the granulated Splenda is, is it's considered insignificant uh, in calories. Um, up to 165 packets per day is considered safe of the Splenda. <clears throat> yeah, that, so that, 
that's good news. So I know sometimes, I think we think back to the 70s when saccharin, there was a lot of, uh, got a lot of negative press back in the 70s. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, it's not that I would recommend you eat 165 packets a day. I would think there'd be other ways you'd want to get your, your calories and your carbohydrates. So, um, so just some uh, tips for baking with Splenda. Cook for cookies, it's best to substitute only the white sugar in the recipe with Splenda and not the brown sugar so that the, they stay moist enough. And then for cakes and cook, quick breads, uh, you could use a smaller pan. Uh, my favorite pumpkin bread recipe that I make, I just added more batter to the pan uh, it, so it rose up, high, it looked like a normal pumpkin bread loaf. Or you could use a smaller pan, maybe instead of a nine inch pan, use an eight inch pan. So there's two ways. I'll go ahead, go ahead. My question was if you're doing um, breads in the bread maker, how will the Splenda work or what else would you substitute for sugar? I think I would try it and, and get on the website and look for a couple of recipes. And I would try it with the sugar blend. Uh, and I would try it with the granulated Splenda too. So the nice thing about these sugar blends, and we'll talk more about that, is that they are still lower in calories, but they make a moist product too. So it's kind of a compromise. So, and look, take a look at the fat in your recipes too, and what you can substitute for oil. Again, 900 calories in, in a half a cup of oil. So that's a great question, and I will take more questions a little bit closer to the end. But go ahead, Joan. Right, that's a very good point. Very that, sugar, you only need about two right, we need that. Uh, her point was that if you're baking your own bread, the sugar is the leavening agent. So you would, if you're going to use uh, sugar, a sugar substitute, I would recommend a, a sugar blend as opposed to the granulated Splenda. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a very good point. So. Um, another thing you can do to help your product rise a little bit more if you use the granulated Splenda, again, the granulated Splenda versus the, the sugar blend, half sugar, uh, just plain granulated Splenda, would be to uh, use a non-fat dry milk powder and baking soda for every, use some non-fat dry milk powder and some baking soda for every cup of granulated Splenda to help it rise a little bit more. So again, go to these websites. There's some wonderful tips on these websites. So. Okay, remember tab, saccharin is still around, uh, going stronger than ever. Uh, it's uh, 500, three to 500 times sweeter than sugar. One packet is still about two calories. Uh, and the, it's heat stable for baking and cooking and canning. It wouldn't be my first choice for baking, but it's still in a lot of beverages and items that we get at the grocery store and that's fine. Uh, and again, go to the website sweetandlow.com for any, any more tips on the, the saccharin. I often get asked, is saccharin safe? Uh, uh, today, it's used in over 100 countries. The FDA considers a safe level. 150, uh, 150-pound adult could safely consume uh, about nine packets a day. So that's significantly less than the other uh, products. So you still want to, you know, use any of these sweeteners in moderation, but use them to your advantage. So. Uh, my favorite pumpkin bread loaf, uh, my, where I lowered the fat calories, and you could also use whole wheat flour in, in your, your nut breads, and that's just one example. But I was able to lower the calories in just one loaf of bread by over 1,000. So that's significant when you think of cutting back the oil to a half a cup and then cutting the sugar in half. Then there's stevia. Stevia is the new kid on the block. Do we have anyone that is using stevia? Okay, good. Okay. I think we, we don't, maybe are a little afraid. It's kind of a new item. So I've, I've been pleasantly surprised again. Uh, lots of different brand name stevia products out there. Uh, one packet is, can vary in calories from zero to one or from one to four grams of carbohydrate because some of the stevia blends have, uh, one of them, Truvia, has uh, some sugar alcohol in it uh, to add bulk and texture, so it's going to have a little, a few calories. Uh, and then the Pervia contains dextrose, which is another type of sugar, so that's why your calorie is going to vary. Stevia comes from uh, Asia. It's a cousin to ragweed and daisies. Uh, it gets its sweetness from two chemicals. Uh, Rebiana is the chemical uh, on, the sh on the grocery shelves uh, that sweetens the, the stevia. It, you currently find it in tabletop sweeteners, beverages, and, and many food products. And you can, you can bake with the stevia products as well. 
Uh, in some of the stevia blends or brands, you, you don't want to replace the sugar cup for cup. Again, go to uh, your website uh, to do a little bit of reading. Uh, read the package if you're going to bake with some of these stevia blends. Uh, you may need to lower or, or, or the baking time for sure. When I made my pumpkin bread, like I said, it was done in about 30 to 40 minutes as opposed to 50 minutes. So keep an eye on it when it's in the oven. Uh, is stevia safe? There's no significant adverse side effects that have been reported up to now. Uh, you may experience some bloating or nausea or diarrhea or an aftertaste. Uh, a 150 pound person could safely consume 40 packets of tabletop stevia sweetener per day. It's not that I'm recommending that, but people want to know what's considered a safe level. And then there's the monk fruit extract. Some of you uh, may have seen uh, these products on the shelves. Uh, that comes from southern China. It's actually the extract, the, the sweetness from a, it's a melon-like fruit going on, grown on a vine. It looks like a lime. It's 300 times sweeter than sugar. It contains uh, ac antioxidants, actually. Antioxidants are chemicals in our food and environment that can prevent or slow uh, cell damage. So the mogrosides are the antioxidants in the monk fruit that uh, are getting some popular press. Um, you'll see monk fruit in many different brands over the counter or on the shelves. Monk fruit in the raw, Lakanto monk fruit sweetener, a health Garden Monk Fruit Sweetener. Uh, I have an example here I'm going to show you in a bit. Uh, Skinny Girl Monk Fruit Extract Liquid Sweetener. Uh, again, one packet of monk fruit in the raw is considered zero calories and 0.8 grams of carbohydrate. Um, and again, the Mo sides that have the antioxidant properties may have the ability, and they're researching this, they may have the ability to prevent diabetes complications because they're lower on the glycemic index, so meaning they, if they, they don't make your blood sugar rise as fast. So the monk fruit, though, however, has not undergone extensive uh, testing. There are no recommended uh, levels of, of safe usage at this point. So. Uh, it does have generally recommended uh, as safe status since 2008, so that's why we see it on the shelves. But uh, be cautious, uh, I wouldn't recommend using it uh, in excess. Uh, it is heat stable and it's suitable for baking and cooking. Uh, again, you see it in lots of uh, products in the grocery store. So, uh, and again, go to intheraw.com to learn a little bit more about monk fruit if, that, if you wish to, um, to maybe bake or cook with it. So. Your sugar substitute blends, again, is a mixture of half uh, sugar and half artificial sweetener. Uh, generally, if the recipe calls for one cup of sugar, if you're going to use a sugar substitute blend, uh, you would use half the amount. So if the recipe called for one cup of real sugar, you, use, you would use half of the sugar substitute. And these are just some examples of some brand names of sugar substitutes. Uh, we looked at the Splenda here, and we're gonna sh I'm going to show that to you in a minute here. There's Pervia, Turbano, Raw Cane Sugar. Uh, that's a Stevia product, uh, Stevia blend. I baked with the Truvia baking blend and was pleasantly surprised at, at my pumpkin bread and how great it turned out. Uh, and then Truvia also, which is a Stevia product, also makes the brown sugar blend. Uh, so just some examples. These do contain calories. Again, these sugar blends do contain calories, so uh, you want to be accountable for them when you're counting your carbohydrates. Just a little comparison here. Uh, real sugar, uh, half a cup of real sugar is about 400 calories. So you can see by reducing the sugar in your recipe just by a half a cup, that's a savings of over 400 calories and about 100 grams of carbohydrate. If you use a sugar blend such as Splenda or a Stevia sugar blend, or there's other sugar blends out there as well, uh, they're only about 200 calories and about 50 grams of carbohydrate per half cup. So I'm going to move over to the table here and just point out to you a few things that we've been talking about. Uh, this, these two items here are, the sh are examples of sugar blends, half sugar, half artificial sweetener. Uh, this is the brown, there's actually a brown sugar blend, and it looks, it looks just like brown sugar. It, it looks like it, it acts like it, it smells like it. Uh, you're more than welcome to come up here uh, when we're done. Uh, but again, half the, uh, it's even moist, so half the calories. So, and again, you only need about half the amount in your recipes is real sugar. So this is a Truvia baking blend. I use this to make my, my pumpkin bread, and I, was, I hadn't uh, baked with the Stevia product before, so I wanted to try it. Uh, it has a nice little pour spout here. 
Um, so again, it looks a lot like sugar, a little, it almost looks like sugar granules with a little powdered sugar. So, and again, when we're done, you're all welcome to come up and take a look here. Uh, this is your granulated Splenda, and, and uh, there's other uh, sugar substitutes that are granulated as well. You could put this on your cereal, you could put it in your iced tea. Uh, it's lighter. It almost looks like fake snowflakes, <laughs> and it's real little, you know, they're real little and light. So, and again, same thing in your Splenda packets here. So, only about 48 calories per cup. This would probably make a drier product, so you're going to have to take a look at maybe not cutting your fat back as much or, or, or adding some, some applesauce, something to uh, keep it moist. So uh, try it, try it. You, if you're either going to like it and make it again and modify it, or you're not going to like it. What, what do you have to lose? So um, this is just an example of the monk fruit in the raw, just one of the monk fruit uh, products here. This is a sweetener that you can put in your, uh, in your coffee or on your cereal. Uh, it's very fine as well too, almost like a powder, so. All right, and then just a reminder, a, a cold, harsh reminder. <laughs> How many calories is in one cup of sugar? 400. 400. Double that, 800. One cup of sugar, 800 calories. Yeah, I fooled you before I had 400 on the, the slide, but 800 calories, half a cup of sugar, and 200 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, the other thing that we forget as well, uh, vegetable oil, just a half a cup, nine over 900 calories. So, so you can see how you can really modify some of your favorite baked goods, cut back the oil, cut back on the sugar. Uh, again, I saved over a thousand calories on one of my favorite pumpkin bread loaf recipes. So, so I would encourage you to give it a try. And remember, a one second spray is how many calories? A one second spray of a vegetable spray. Seven, seven, yeah. Only seven calories for a one second spray of a vegetable spray. So, so keep that in mind too. Uh, one tablespoon of oil, 120 calories. Often when we saute and we fry, we overestimate how much oil we really need. So, uh, and this makes a nice coating, the vegetable oil too, on a, a loaf of banana bread after you pull it out of the oven, if you've lowered the fat content or used a sugar substitute. So. Um, so hopefully you got some good tips today. Uh, I will uh, answer some more questions uh, after class here and stick around. Uh, we hope to see you, and I, I recognize a lot of faces here from our diabetes classes, and uh, uh, come and see us again. And uh, we do individual counseling as well. Uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, good luck cooking for the holidays, and happy Thanksgiving. It's almost upon us, so thank you very much. The Sun Health Center for Health and Well-Being offers a variety of informative classes, one-on-one -on -one consultations, and valuable memberships. To find out more about our unique services, contact us today at 623-832-WELL. That's 623-832-9355. Or visit us online at sunhealthwellbeing.org.